The Weedsman Podcast. ChristopherMedia.net. No se viene a Las Vegas por un juego, una carrera, una pelea, un partido o un equipo. Vienes para un épico previo al juego y tres días de postjuego. Vienes por el Showtime, el Go Time y 24 horas de Prime Time. Porque el juego es solo el comienzo. Las Vegas, la arena más grandiosa del mundo. Descubre más en visitlasvegas.com. Finding the right person for the job isn't easy. Just ask someone who hired their personal trainer as a caterer. All right, folks, let's keep this line moving. You there with the tongs. Picking up one Duchess potato at a time will not cut it at my catering table. Drop and give me 50. But if you've got an insurance question, you can always count on your local GEICO agent. They can bundle your policies, which could save you hundreds. Okay, this is what we call the wild mushroom and asparagus dip, dip, and press. Come on, let's get those plates above your heads. For expert help with all your insurance needs, visit geico.com slash local today. Did you know Amazon provides ways of working that fit your lifestyle? They know you value your time outside of work, juggling family, school, friends, or other activities. That's why they offer a variety of shifts that work for you. There are full-time, part-time, and even temporary opportunities that can work with your schedule with great starting pay and sign-on bonuses. If you want a career that fits and adapts to your lifestyle, head to Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is a proud equal opportunity employer. Christopher Media. Let's make some noise. From Asmacore Studios near Detroit, Michigan, oh, man. it's the Weedsman Podcast. I have no idea what's going on. And now, you have smoked yourself retarded. Here are the Weedsmen. You want to get hot? Hey, I'm Chris. I'm Aaron. I, I, I got nothing witty. I got nothing. I got nothing Jan- <laughs> It's January though, right? And it just kind of like it's this, it's this time of year where you just like, yeah. Bleh. I wasn't sure if you're. I can't hear the. Uh, I can't hear the intro. Oh, oh yeah, it's going. Yeah, it's playing. I'm not going to be able to hear anything that you play then. Oh, that's the, that's the difference in the routing. Ah, the routing that you selected is the direct input of the microphone that you have. Ah, but the routing that we usually use is a mix. So that goes into one of those other channels. So let me just try something here. La, 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 and you're gone because I moved that. To, to, to that back. Yeah. Do you have some... Go ahead and play me some audio that's just going to continue so I have something to reference. I know when I've got the right one selected. And you don't have to just sit there and check the mic. Over and over there. Yeah, there's some audio playing right now. Okay, so I'm going to switch the input. So it's on three and four. Seven eights. I'm here in America. Fuck yeah. Okay. I'm here in America. Kill that, please, and let. Can I hear you? All right. No, I don't think I can hear you. So, uh, that uh, it is the spadiff. The spadiff is the loop. Is the loop mix? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Now, bring me back that. That's it. That's it. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can barely hear it. Can you turn it up a little bit? Is that too loud on your end? No. Okay. Something's not bad, but that's that's better. Okay. And then I think this is fine. Yeah, no, I can hear it good. <laughs> Disney World. Fuck yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's got to be the spadiff. All right. Shall we take to it? There we go. I don't know. I can just edit around some of that. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> it's te- technical difficulties. It, it happens with all podcasts. But we're back on track. Yes. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, I'm hoping for very few technical difficulties coming up. I have a trip planned in New York, and it's the first flight that I'm going to be on since, gosh, I don't know when the last time I was on an airplane. Have you flown post 9-11? Oh, yeah. I've done plenty of that when I worked for Guitar Center. But outside of that, like, no, I, I definitely haven't flown in the COVID era. Oh, in the virus times? Yeah. And I picked a flight that's two days after the launch of G5. So we'll see. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did I say G5? Uh, 
What is it? It's G, uh, 5G. Did I say G5? It, you mean like... Now, I it, saw an article. Like, they're trying to put the 5G in the plane so you can use your phone. Is that what's going on? Ooh. That is, that is not what's going on. Okay. No, I they're woefully th- misinformed then. So they are... There's been a lot of back and forth over the idea that the uh, the 5G rollout is going to cause interference with the... Uh, the FAA's uh, communications traffic. What do you and, mean roll? I mean, I've I've been on five G for months. It's already out, isn't it? Uh, is this going to be another Y two K situation? I, it could oh, be. Planes yeah. are just going to fall out of the sky. It's crazy. Well, you know, it's like Y two K was exaggerated, but it wasn't an unreasonable concern, and it wasn't an issue because. We made an issue out of it beforehand, and people did something about it. It's like it, it's the the cost you pay for being successful. We were so successful at getting ahead of the Y two K problem and solved it so successfully that everyone said it was a hoax. International Airlines suspends some U.S. flights over five G issue. That's the latest one. Uh, yeah. I, I, there's story experts say 5G rollout unlikely to impact operations. Well, yeah, I the, mean, is, is this is this all because someone read a news story that had a maybe or a might in the fucking headline or read so, like what it's, because somebody read? No, I mean, I mean, what is the concern? The concern is canceled flights. I, well, why are they why, why are they canceling flights based on what? Like, I don't know. They're, we don't know. Something might happen. Uh, it would suspend flights into nine U.S. airports, Boston, Chicago, O'Hare, Dallas, Fort Worth. This is specifically uh, the story about international flights. Uh, in, well, let's see. Emirates, India Air, Nippon Airways, Japan Airlines. They're all cutting service for now for to all these major ports. Uh, it doesn't look like Detroit's, Detroit or well, I got Detroit, uh, New York. Em. Yeah, we'll, we'll still fly into there. See, we're working closely with aircraft manufacturers to alleviate operational concerns. I don't know, man. Gamma radiation or some shit. Who knows? It's not my concern. I didn't bring it up because I'm concerned about 5G. No, I know. I brought it up because I'm concerned that the concern over 5G is going to cancel my flight. Hey, but you're heading to a spot where they're still going to be flying. Yeah, apparently. So what is this? A few countries are like, oh, they got this crazy new network. We don't know how it's going to end. Like, I mean, I get it. They're the ex, they're the you know they're they're in the field. They're doing it every day. This and that, and it's well, better you know, safe than sorry. But at the same, I, it's time, really it's unfortunate that we've been primed with five G nonsense leading up to this. So now, anytime anyone has like what might be a legitimate concern, they just go into the bucket of of wackos. Yeah, remember so how who knows? coronavirus I mean, virus was from 5G? Remember that? Remember that it, old chestnut? It, it, it could be, yeah. So it could be that they're, they're just making nothing out of this, or maybe they're being too cautious. But I don't think that this is, I mean, obviously, it, their, if their concern was 5G in general, then it wouldn't, they wouldn't be targeting specifically American cities to exempt from their, uh, from their, uh, their, uh, from them using. I guess. Like, do you think if it was a concern it, at it all would, with anyone anywhere? Do you think planes would be right, flying but, at all? You no, know, inevitably. We, I'm sure if we dig into this far enough, we'll at some point find out that like the U.S. is rolling this out in a really stupid way, I'm, and and that's why. Because other countries, I mean, these other countries that have these concerns, they're already ahead of us in 5G rollout. So, uh, oh, here's some specifics. Federal Aviation Administration has been worried that 5G cellular antennas near some airports could throw off readings from some aircraft equipment designed to tell pilots how far they are from the ground. So it could just be like a regulations thing. Like maybe in Japan, they're like, yeah, we put out 5G and we put it far the fuck away from our airports. And you guys didn't. Huh? What? You mean we rushed? Come on. We didn't rush it. Like I said, we're behind. Actually, all this nonsense over over 5G has... uh, has really hindered the rollout. Yeah, there, there wasn't this concern between 3G and 4G. Well, there there was like legitimate concerns over the radiation. They're like, maybe you shouldn't put this so close to your balls. And we were like, nah, it's all right. We're, we're not worried about it. this. Is way too cool having a computer in our pocket to worry about our testicular health. And now, oh God, you try to take it away from us now. 
I'll fucking stab you. The dick would stab you first. Be like, that's where we keep our porn. Right. In addition to, it's how everything gets brought to me now. Yeah. What, do you want me to go to the store? Now I make someone else go to the store for me. Well, right. I mean, can I you spend imagine? spend at least $50. This is, like I said earlier, this is the first time that I've been to New York. But imagine what 20 years ago a trip to New York would have been like. Oh, you should get some traveler's checks. You don't want to take your own checkbook with you to New York. You know, that, that, that is another thing that we probably don't hear about that the smartphone killed. Because I remember when I was younger getting them for when you go on vacation. Yeah. In case your money got fucking stolen. Now, like, whatever, you got dudes all on your phone. Apple Pay, Google Pay, whatever pay, Venmo, Cash App, PayPal. Yeah, there's no so, more commercials that say never leave home. What was it? Don't leave home without them or whatever. Wasn't that the campaign? The tra- Yeah, I think yeah, the traveler's trucks. Mm-hmm. That was more of like, that. Would, that's more of if you go like overseas, right? If you're like, if your vacation involved the Indiana Jones map. Yeah. I mean, would you get them for domestic travel? Because I was thinking like you wouldn't want to take your, if you take your credit cards and your checkbook and then that gets stolen some, and then you know, all your info's out there versus like if you get your traveler's check stolen, you're out the money, but you're not out all your personal info as well. See, I would think domestically going somewhere where like you're going to go, I would get them. At least right. back in the day. Yeah. You know, you get pickpocketed in the subway, you can get your money back. Because that was a thing with them, right? I don't know. If could they, you get your? You couldn't get your money back, though. No, could they, you? no, that was the thing with them. If they got stolen, you could get them replaced. Oh, because they could track them, yeah. right? Yeah. So if somebody tries to turn them, and they're like, "No." Did they have? Uh, was there? Was there a spokesperson for travelers' checks? Oh, there was. My my little kid memory banks are telling me. I believe there was a slew of like. Uh, Did they go on like a, a whole campaign of like famous people. Yeah, but I want to say, too, it was kind of like, it wasn't like now, you know, where like Baldwin's Hawk and Capital One or yeah. Sam Jackson, like it was... Back in the day, you still had to get be, them I believe on the still, downslide of the career. Like, yeah, you were, you were definitely, yeah, if you were doing the... the What's Goldie Hawn doing these days? <laughs> Can we get her? <laughs> I know now Telly Savalas did the Diners Club, but I want to say yeah. it was like that kind of tier. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, because at that point, he wasn't on television anymore. I mean, Kojak reruns were running, but that was pretty much his gig. And now, I mean, like, look, nobody is, like, dissing, you know, Samuel L. Jackson for being the what's in your wallet, dude. Like, he gets to do that and make movies with Quentin Tarantino at the same time. No, uh, J.K. Simmons still does the Farmers commercials. Yeah. That's true, yeah. Post Oscar. Post Oscar, post Marvel. Uh Carl Malden. Carl uh, Malden. Was the one doing the uh who, who, I know the name, but I couldn't tell you who the fuck that was. Who's Carl Malden? Was he uh was he an actor? Yeah, he was an old school actor. Let's uh, let's IMDB him. I was watching Cold Check the Night Stalker while well, I watched half an episode and I was like, oh, I don't know how people do this. Uh, Street to San Francisco, on the waterfront. Okay. Streetcar named Desire, Patton. Okay, so he's been in some shit. Yeah, so it's like that era. But yeah, he was the guy doing the the, uh, uh, the Traveler's Checks commercials yeah. in the eighties. See this? There's a 1987 one. Kids walking on a beach. Hey, Chris! You can't go surfing dressed like that. Dude drives up behind him in a jeep. Home. Oh, I thought you were staying all week. Mom wanted ice cream last night. Dad couldn't find our money. Well, what, did he lose it? Somebody stole it. I'm sorry. Relatable well, situation. Show, though, huh? Yeah. It would happen to you right here in the U.S., so don't carry cash. Carry American Express traveler's checks. Don't leave yeah. home without them. Oh, I totally remember that guy's voice now. <laughs> yeah. He's got the big bulbous nose. Yeah. Could happen. You too could be left wanting for ice cream because your father got robbed. Now let's talk probably about the by a Hispanic of this commercial though, because this kid is just walking on the beach and a full-grown man in a jeep drives up behind him, and pretty much. Hey, you coming to hang out? Yeah. What is that? Like, why isn't it him talking to his dad 
And his dad having to explain that, like, his cash got stolen. Why is it like, or like the I was just chatting up some strange adult that was following me home yeah. about how my dad got robbed. And, exactly. Like, that was the dude. That's probably the dude. Yeah, right. He's like, hey, that's the family that I saw. Watch this. I'm going to fuck with this kid. Hey, what's up? You don't got any ice cream? Oh, that's too bad. I think he's asking about coming to hang out and surf. But again, full grown adult. Coming to hang out and surf. No, like, not even a little kid with him to be like, oh, hey, here's yeah. your buddy Tommy. You guys going surfing again? No. Like, why is this full-grown man bummed out that he can't hang out with this little kid? He's, he's got something you can surf. Like, if, hold on. Maybe, what is his nephew? Like, let's see. Did they establish a relationship? Yeah, maybe they did and I missed that. Hey, Chris. Can't go surfing dressed like that. Can't today. Going home. Home? I thought you were staying all week. Mom wanted ice cream last night. What does he say at the beginning? I can't hear He says you can't go surfing dressed like that. No, but he says, hey. Yeah, he says, hey. He says, hey, Chris. That's his name. He says, you can't go surfing dressed like that. Yeah. He's like, oh, we got to go home. So my dad got his money stolen. So he knows him. Yeah. But he's an adult without a child. I I hope that's his uncle, right? I just hope this is a family member. Because, again, like, on the surface... Well, it is is weird that they didn't... I mean, why bring in a third party to this situation, right? Your situation for your commercial is, okay, we have a family and they got their money stolen and now the kid's bummed because he's got to go home. So how do we establish that? Let's have some random unidentified adult come in and talk to the kid alone. In a full-size Jeep... On a beach, by the way. Well, you know, that was the thing in the 80s. You'd drive your Jeep on the beach. I guess so. Dude, Andy legal. looked like every it villain in every 80s movie on ever, the by the way. It's like, what? The way this guy was dressed. He looked like every villain in every 80s teen movie, by the way. <laughs> with with the what hair way? and the windbreaker. <laughs> I'm, I'm having a hard time picturing villainous 80s hair. <laughs> like a mullet? No, remember, like there's, there's always like perm? the evil preppy guy. Right. The, uh, yeah, the asshole prep, yeah. Yeah, he's looking like that guy. Okay. He doesn't sound like no surfer. Think of the villain in Back to School. How about Blaine? It's not a name. It's a major appliance <laughs> from uh, <clears throat> from Pretty in Pink. Uh, what's his name? Uh, that was uh, the guy who played Ultron. Oh, Robert Downey Jr.? Oh, that's the guy who played. That's the guy who plays Iron Man. That's the guy who made Ultron. The guy who voiced Ultron is uh, Jane Spader. He was Blaine in Pretty in Pink. He was the the evil preppy dude. But yeah, no, uh, Robert Downey Jr. played that type in Weird Science. Oh, yeah. The, the hair's a little too feathered looking at pictures of Blaine. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, James Spader. Looking at him now compared to this. I want to say what happened, but the answer is time. I don't know. I, I'm sure there's plenty of women who would still drop the panties for James Spader. Well, that hair is gone. That's my yeah. point. He, I don't know. He, he wears it well. He's, he went to, he's he got went, a good. Well, he's he got a to, good head for bald. Well, he went to shaving the head a while ago. But yeah, it's yeah. the the last I uh, I think the last time he tried, was trying to hold on to his hair was when his his run on the office. Oh, that's right. When he's Robert California, but since he's been doing the blacklist, he's gone. He's gone to the shaved head. I, I think that Jane Spader can be really funny, but I didn't find that character too funny. I don't necessarily blame him. I guess is what I'm saying. I find with all the people that were probably chomping at the bit to be on that show, yeah, I found it, that casting choice kind of really all was, the people you could have casted. This is who you went with. It was so questionable. I mean, I don't know how you could imagine that Jane Spader and what he does would fit into the office. Yeah, that's like, I mean, just if you look at all the all the all the people that they got to do cameos for that, you know, for those last few shows in that season, you know, they had yeah. Will Ferrell do the runner. You know, they had what they had Ray, Ray Romano, Jim Carrey. But the whole the whole show really hinges on a cast that knows how to hit that sweet spot, right? How to hit, like, that Venn diagram of actually funny, 
over the top zany and still be relatable characters, you know? Yeah. And it's not something it's, it's like an unwritten recipe. I mean, you can't just start stirring it. Like what, why don't we just put some hot peppers in here? Everybody likes spicy stuff. No, like you can't fuck with it. Yes. Michael Scott leaving should have been that show's last episode. Yeah. They were trying to milk that cash cow a little more. And it just, like, uh, but I'll tell you, I'll watch season eight. I'll watch the James Spader season. I do not watch season nine when I'm going through the office. I yeah. just, that, that one's tough. Yeah. That one is just, uh, yeah, that one was bad. And, and Will Ferrell is like bad for the opposite. Re- He's on the other spectrum of James Spader and still not in that sweet spot. I mean, I love both of what these guys do separately, but they don't do the office. Yeah. I think if NBC was smart, they could have just kind of franchised it like Walking Dead style and just started a new office. You know, just went to another city. The office, you know, fucking butt fuck Montana. Yeah, right. Go to West Coast this time. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like the office in. Well, the- yeah. Jane Spader would have been great for a West Coast office. Yeah, like the office and, in Oregon or whatever. Yeah, and to, this is like this is why like if TV movies ultimately learned a lot of lessons from comics that TV has never learned. If this was a comic, if The Office was a comic book, as soon as it started to be successful, they would have spun off a West Coast office and have it run concurrently and cross over from time to time. So once a season. There'd be an episode where Michael Scott's coming to the West Coast to show up, and you'd have a two-parter episode. And then when you lose, uh, what's his nuts for Michael Scott for that off? Then you just can't. Okay, the original office is is closed, but you still got the West Coast office. And now it's not like you have to reintroduce it. Like everybody already knows all these characters, and they're like, "All right, well, I wish the original was still around, but this is still pretty good. This is still familiar to me." They don't. TV doesn't know how to franchise shit like that. They used to. Well, I think Norman Lear knew. Yeah. Right. Norman Lear knew how to do that. He knew. He created his whole fucking universe of of characters crossing over. He created a whole world on television. Uh, that, uh, the what's her name? Uh, Carseed Werner knew what to do because they did it with the Cosby Show. They managed to do it. Uh, because they did it with a different world, and they did it too with Cheers, right? I mean, arguably, Frasier oh, yeah. was bigger than Cheers. That's true. I mean, they well, there was no point where they were running concurrently, though, was there? Oh, Fra- no, it was, it was a successful was a spin-off. spinoff. Yeah, it was a successful spinoff, but after Cheers had already closed. But now with the Cosby in a different world, those were yeah, concurrent. That, see, that's how TV does it, and sometimes they're successful at that, but. Only when they manage to pick the right horse to spin off from that show. And obviously, although most people wouldn't have looked at Frasier to be the character to spin off from. I mean, if you would ask, ask around in like the what was the height of Cheers, like 1989 or something? Yeah. And say like, oh, who would you want to see spin? Oh, let's see. You know, I'd want to keep following uh, uh What's his nuts? The bartender, you know, Sam or, or Woody or whoever the fuck. You, you wouldn't think Frazier. But too, I think at the time, it, too, it kind of signaled, a, uh, you know, uh, TV, you know, it's one of those things that holds a mirror, right? We were kind of shifting from bar room culture to like the coffee house culture. Yeah. No, it was, it was a really smart choice. I mean, I think it's a. Uh, I think it's one of the better comedies of its time, certainly. I know I'm not, like, blowing anybody's mind with that. But – and I and I think it still holds up because they were able to understand that they didn't – you know, they needed to adapt it, right? We want to take this character, but we can't just do Cheers in Seattle. And we can't just do Cheers now in the 90s. Yeah, because essentially if you look – Cheers is about a group of functional alcoholics – and you're right. Like, 80s was really about bar culture, right? You, people went to bars because that's how you, that is how you met people. How the fuck would you ever get laid if you never went to a fucking bar in the 80s? Like, let's be honest. Norman Cliff had a problem. Absolutely. 
Like, they definitely should have been going to the same meetings. It's amazing anybody got their mail in that town. Fraser had a problem. <laughs> Sam Malone would definitely have been Me too You know, he'd have all kinds of suits against him now. Well, that was the other part of it. I mean, the, the bar, like, like you said, the bar culture, that, that kind of, you know, crass machismo that was really popular in the 80s and then the 90s was about the 90s was the, the start of woke culture i know i know that this generation thinks that they invented all this wokeness no it was we, political, we were there at the beginning it was we were there political at the beginning. correctness kids absolutely <laughs> we witnessed the rise yes we saw this bullshit begin <laughs> yes i knew it when it was just a little turd at the top of the hill yes we both we both saw our parents. <laughs> and we go, said, "What the? Oh, fuck? that's funny. Yeah. Seems harmless." <laughs> we both saw our parents go, "What the fuck is this shit?" Yeah. No, the PCU, right? Yeah, that movie Actually, now holds up. Holds up though. Would be like a documentary. But, 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 but the thing is, is a lot of the things that were like so absurd in that movie that made it funny. Now you look at them and be like, "Oh no, that exists now." Yes. The extremes, the extreme archetypes depicted in PCU are now the norm. And you, if you, I, I say it holds up as, you know, somebody in their 40s who saw it when it came out originally. And I was like, hey, you know, it's still, a, it's still actually funny and, uh, and relatable. But, you know, I think people, kids these days would watch it and go, I don't get it. Are we supposed to be laughing at these people? They're right. 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 Jeremy Piven still had his real hair. Yeah. His, his, or I should say his original hair. It's funny. His, his hairline today, a lot, a lot further down his forehead than it was in PCU. It's crazy. Right. When he, but he was like, he was still really young in that. Yeah, though, he started original. losing his hair early. Like, I don't even think he was, he was probably still in his 20s when he's, he he's, started losing his. He's shit, one right? of those guys that's been playing middle aged for like twenty five years, right? I guess in the new, what's the new Mark Wahlberg movie that's on Paramount, and he's playing a guy who's supposed to be like thirty two years old or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, like, come on! Well, no, like it was, it was a ten years ago ish. Cusack had a run where he came back for a minute, was in a bunch of movies, and he was playing 30-year-olds. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's that great shot. What was the, the movie that he did where the world was ending? Oh, uh, uh, 2012? Yeah. And he, there's a shot of his license. <laughs> yeah. And he was, like, I remember at the time, real. I was like, hey, we're supposed to be the same age? You're John Cusack, <laughs> yeah. buddy. Fuck you. I said, you were an adult. I watched you as an adult yeah. when I was a kid. <laughs> what time do you remember in Hot Tub Time Machine? <laughs> they had him with all these people, and I'm like, I mean, I get it. You're you're John Cusack, and you're a name, and you're in the movie, and you've always been known for having a little bit of a baby face. But you are at least yeah. ten years older than the old this the second oldest cast member in this movie. But but a woman gets some crow's eyes, and you're like, oh, uh, we could use somebody for the mom, right? You could be the crazy aunt. Yeah, I don't know, but. It, I, Hollywood, just so you know, the perception is we know when dudes are playing younger than they're supposed to, and we think it looks ridiculous. At this point, John Cusack, for a while, John Cusack should have been playing people's fathers, yeah. appropriately aged fathers. Not like, oh, hey, I'm the young 31-year-old dad with a 2-year-old. No. At this point, John Cusack, all your kids on screen should be in college. The Weedsman Podcast. ChristopherMedia.net. Did you know Amazon provides ways of working that fit your lifestyle? They know you value your time outside of work, juggling family, school, friends, or other activities. That's why they offer a variety of shifts that work for you. There are full-time, part-time, and even temporary opportunities that can work with your schedule with great starting pay and sign-on bonuses. If you want a career that fits and adapts to your lifestyle, head to Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is a proud equal opportunity employer. ChristopherMedia.net. The Weedsman Podcast. You know, here's an example. We were talking earlier about creating, like Norman Lear creating a whole universe of shows that, that tied in together. And Mike Judge does, he kind of does that a little bit. And there's, uh, there's a story today that he's bringing back King of the Hill. 
Nice. We are very excited to go into different tones and different styles and try to expand the animation art form. Daniels explains. Greg, uh, I'm sorry, that's Greg Daniels, his partner in his, uh, in his animation company called Bandera Entertainment, which is curious because, like, wasn't the big one of the big animation houses when we were kids Bandai? Yes. You would see that at the credits. So maybe, maybe it's a tribute because I don't think Bandai is still around. Or maybe Bandai merged with somebody and that's their name now. Yeah. Well, I, I, this sounds like, no, this is, the, they formed a new animation company. So this is Greg Daniels and Mike Judge's company. They didn't like buy somebody else's. Oh, yeah, everyone else forgets. Yeah, that's where Greg, Greg, that's where Greg Daniels came from. Greg Daniels got a start on the, before The Office, before Parks and Rec, before, you know, they'll let him make a show about whatever the fuck he wants. That was his first day, his first gig. Yep. Big gig. Was King of the I Hill. Can't talk. <laughs> yeah. So he was, that quote from him was talking about their animation house in general, not necessarily King of the Hill. King of the Hill, I don't think, is going to be pushing the boundaries of animation art. I imagine you bring back King of the Hill, you stick to the style. What the, it was King of the you Hill. Can't fuck it was, with it was that. like Beavis and Butthead. It wasn't about the animation. It was about yeah. the writing. No, absolutely. I mean, any of them these days. Any Simpsons has become like super slick and all that, but it it was never really about the animation. Although they've have done some really fantastic stuff on that show. And there you go. But yeah, but you're Rick and Morty. Well, even Rick and Morty, like they simplify most of it so that they can leave. Uh, budget for them to do, oh, uh, you know, here's where we do a two minute segment where everything goes batshit crazy, right? Yeah. And that way they can just, it's like a, an effects budget for a movie, you know? We're going to stage this all super simple so that when we get to the monster, we can really invest in them. But yeah, the King of the Hill is just definitely it, it, just simple art form that, that tells a story. And it's really like, the Beavis and Butthead style, the King of the Hill, it still it looks kind of rough still, but there's an a brilliance to the simplicity. I mean, there's there's an economy of line that I think is actually beautiful in how they can with so few lines express all these emotions on these characters. Well, it's timing, right? It's this timing and writing. Well, yeah, no, I, what you're saying, that's, that's what comes through in the voice acting and all that. But I'm talking about the actual, just the, the, the visual aspect of the art. You know, even though uh, you know, it's not like detailed art, still with, uh, with a few lines, you're able to know with the sound off how Hank is feeling about any given situation. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's... Somewhat... And, and to do it subtly, right? Because Hank's not an emotive person. So once you know the show, you would be able to identify, like, sad Hank and happy Hank. But those aren't... That's not, like, a wide... You know, it's just a little curvature of a line going one way or another that could determine whether Hank looks happy or sad. Yeah, but, you get, but yeah, but don't you say you're still able to do it? You're still able to get it. Yes. Said, no, I'm, I'm so praising them. said some of the best I'm praising Beavis them. and Butthead jokes. They never said a word. It's like some of my favorite comic book artists. You know, there's a lot of comic book artists that they just pile on lines and shading and cross hatching, And it's great. So, you know, some of the stuff just looks fantastic. But then there's others that some people dismiss as like too cartoony. But I'm like, no, like there's so few lines outlining this whole character in this page here. But yet you get so much from it because you don't have everything else cluttering it up. You just have the expression, you know, coming through of the, you know, what the, the body language or the facial expression. The one panel where it's just them with their eyes squinted and it says so right. much. Yeah, exactly. Stuff like that. But, it, but not like overly detailed, you know, that the, they can get an eye squint without having to like draw a bunch of lines around the eyes. Yeah. So at... I mean, Daniel Radcliffe is. I was going to change subject, but uh, no go. No, I was just say it means Stephen Root getting more work for Stephen Root. Stephen Root he popped up in the latest episode of Boba Fett. Oh, well, so he's the voice of Bill in King of the Hill. He's probably yep. getting that paycheck again. Now, oh, he's I, Stephen Root is in goddamn near everything now, and is never. I could he he's going to probably be coming back. 
in Boba Fett as well. Because he plays this uh, he, this kind of shady merchant who he comes to Boba Fett seeking his help for he some punk stole water from him. You know they're on Mos Epsa, uh, so there's like you know it's a desert, and uh, it, Boba Fett investigates and finds out that like the reason that they stole the water is because Stephen Root jacked the prices up exorbitantly. You know he was gouging them. So then he kind of like gave Stephen Root the what for, and he just stalked away. But he definitely like tented his fingers <laughs> and stared menacingly. So how is Boba Fett? That's good. Like it doesn't seem like there's a lot of good word of mouth on it. Oh really? Or just word of mouth on it in general? I guess is my whole thing. I don't know. I mean, anything gets the Star Wars out these nerds days. don't seem to be frothing at the mouth for this one like they are for the Mandalorian. Yeah, I don't know. I it seems like I, th- there's a lot. There's a f- handful of people really passionate about it, and yeah, everybody else is like, yeah, it's good. Now, one but, thing I heard is because you're expecting Boba Fett to do Boba Fett things, and he's not. Yeah, which I guess if. I don't know what Boba Fett things are, but I guess, uh, you know, have a jet pack that can take him 60 meters. And didn't he have like a grappling thing that he used in Empire? Well, my question would be, is he bounty hunting? Because isn't that what he's known for? He's the most feared bounty hunter in the galaxy. It's in the name. Yeah. No. So, well, the plot of it is, and this was established at the end of the last season of The Mandalorian, after... Jabba dies, which we see obviously in uh, in Jedi. Bib Fortuna takes over for Jabba. Boba Fett hears about that and is is basically like that punk. Oh hell no! And goes back to Jabba's old, what what once was Jabba's palace and kills Bib Fortuna and he takes over. So he so Boba Fett is now running Mos Epsa. And that's what this is about? Yeah. Well, and it's, it's a twofold story. It's two timelines that they follow. One is the current, quote-unquote, timeline, according to you know, what aligns with the rest of the, the Star Wars shows, like The Mandalorian and all that. And that's the, him taking over Mos Espa. And then the other timeline is, takes place from, the, uh, from him getting thrown into the Sarlacc pit in Jedi. So we see him escape from the Sarlacc pit and we follow his adventures. He gets taken in by the Tuscans and learns their ways. And it's this whole like dances with wolves thing. Or actually, I shouldn't say it's dances with wolves. It's straight up Lawrence of Arabia. Damn. See, like like it is they li- made him raw. It is literally Lawrence of Arabia. Like there's a train going through the desert and they're shooting at Tuscans and he, you know, is staying with the Tuscans. So he like organizes them, gets some speeder bikes from some local punks and they take down the train. But yeah, I still probably fun to watch. It's absolutely fun to watch. You know, they are, what's interesting is, you know, we hear a lot about the, this environment that they, record a lot of these scenes for these shows in you know the um the dome where they can it, where there's actually screens that they can just broadcast backgrounds on and shoot in there and actually have like you know instead of digitizing a background you can actually still have light hitting shit but for these desert scenes they still have to go outside they can't they can't do it in their little matrix thing or whatever they fu- the fuck they call it they have to get out there in a fucking desert and shoot it. And so it's just beautiful. I mean, it's not, a, it's not as beautiful as Dune, but it is goddamn nice looking. And it hits, it's really hitting the sweet spot for me. I mean, I don't know why anyone would want to see Boba Fett continue to do bounty hunting. Because that's pretty much what The Mandalorian was about. Or at least that's what it kind of proposed to be about at the beginning of the show then turned into lone wolf and cub but yeah i mean i want to see i want to see the old characters but take them somewhere new why show us the old character 
doing the same thing he was doing in all the other movies. You remember Buried Out. Yeah. I want to see new shit from Star Wars ultimately, but I love the design of Boba Fett. And I love what they're doing. I think that the, the, cast, is, the cast is brilliant. I mean, the, the casting of Boba Fett is brilliant. Because it's the dude who played his dad in the prequel movies, who played Django Fett. It's the same dude. Nice. And he's really good in it. The watchable part of Attack of the Clones. Yeah. And th- that's another beef that I, people seem to have with it. Well, how come he's, you know, we, we wanted to see a Boba Fett show, and he's got his helmet off all the time. Yeah, he, he's not a fucking Mandalorian. Don't you pay attention? The Mandalorians are the one with the fetish about the helmet. He just borrowed the look. He can take his helmet off whenever the fuck he wants to. He's and why doomed. wouldn't he? You walk around with a helmet on all day? No. You do it when you go into battle. Yeah. Why are you sitting around a throne with a fucking helmet on your, obscuring your face? If I wear the helmet, who will know I'm in charge? And the, it's, it just looks, I mean, outside, I know I already said it looks fantastic, but they're not pulling any punches on this. The special effects are as good as they've ever looked on any Star Wars thing. I mean, that, in the first episode, he fights this crazy sand creature that I've never seen before. Character design is amazing. The way it's shot is stunning. It's like a really gripping scene. I was, I haven't, it's been a long time since I've been sucked into it like a monster like that. You know, we don't really get, like in the Marvel movies, even when they do have like dragons, you're like, okay, that looks cool. This is a good, this is a good popcorn TV show for you. No, oh, absolutely. And one of the, it, it's kind of weird too. It, I don't know if this was intentionally funny, but I found it really funny. There's two, the, there's two, um, there's some relation to Jabba, right? There's twins, twin, you know, whatever slug things, whatever their species is called. So it's basically two Jabba's curled up together on one platform and they're twins, brother and sister. And they, they show up trying to lay claim to Mos Espa and they get carried around on this platform and the platform is, you know, it's got guys all the way around it. So there's like 20 guys all like hunched over and sweating and just looking like they're just getting just crushed under these two fat turds. And then they, they come up in the, that procession to, uh, to Java's old palace to talk to Boba Fett. And then they say they brought him a gift to kind of make up for it. You know, let's, let's let bygones be bygones here. Take this Rancor monster as our gift. And uh, piloted, by the way, by, uh, what's his nuts? Machete dude. Um, Danny Trejo. Yeah, Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo comes up in a giant floating platform, just hovering above the sand gently with a giant Rancor monster on it. And I just imagine being one of those slaves, just crushed under the weight of these two fat aliens. And just your miserable existence. And you look over and you're like, oh, oh, so you do have a floating platform that you can use. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, I get it now. Oh, I see when it comes to, yeah. Yeah. When well, it's time for the presentation, oh, we got all the help in the world. Yeah. We, oh, we can use technology. But until then. <laughs> so what's been going on in news, in uh, pot news lately? Uh, there is a... The MJ Biz Daily shared a story that was said, uh, Outlook dim for U.S. marijuana legalization in 2022, but banking reform alive. So, I like, honestly, I'm surprised that they could say that anything is alive. I mean, what is getting done currently? And we're on a whole decade of, like, Congress really not doing much of anything. Yeah. And this administration seems to be afraid to make a move in any one direction. So I'd be surprised if there was any meaningful push forward this year in in cannabis, period. But the Safe Banking Act is apparently still alive and hopefully moving forward. How shitty is it? It is January. We are 18 days into the new year. And you just think about the statement you just made. Yeah. We got 11 and a half <laughs> months left. Yeah. And we're pretty much going, yeah, shit ain't going to happen. No, oh, I'm, I'm calling it now. Like, it's going to be a year of hearing about plans that never come to fruition. 
that they can never get the votes on and that we're constantly hearing you know, and then and all the news will be taken up by like a handful of idiots who everyone blames for holding up the process when we know it's the system it's not whoever the fuck uh, who is the who is the guy that was uh holding up the um the, the huge bill that they were trying to pass mansion recently yeah mansion yeah everybody's like Dumping on Manchin. Like, what's your problem, Manchin? Come on, Manchin. Don't you want to pass anything? Like, okay, maybe he's an issue, but he's not the issue. Do you not realize the issue is the, like, the format? <laughs> Obviously, communication has, breaking, has broken down in this organization. I agree. It's like, it's like going, like, bitching at Manchin is like going to a shitty restaurant that's got everything wrong with it and then just laying into the bellboy before you leave. Right. About how horrible this is. And he's like, I just fucking work here, man. Yeah, I mean, half of the stuff with him, he's half the time they say he's holding shit up, he's like, yeah, I want to read it. I'm not just going to vote for it. Yeah. And, well, you're holding things up. Why? Because I want to read? Like, and I'm not, I'm not trying to defend him either because I don't... It doesn't sound like our politics align too much, but... Just because I don't agree with him politically doesn't mean that it, it makes sense to like dump everything. Anyways, we're not talking about that. We're talking about cannabis, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's got nothing to do with cannabis. It's true. So, yeah, we'll see what happens with the Safe Banking Act. But I agree with MJ Biz's uh, outlook as far as the rest of the year. I can't imagine a situation where they would bring forth cannabis, national cannabis legalization. I mean, they could try, think about it. Midterms are coming up. Some people could, th you know, there, there could be a lot of elaborate promises made. There's a lot of governors coming up for re-election. You never know. Right, but I don't think that really counts. I mean, that's campaign talk for what we might do in 2023. I'm talking about, like, talking about this in Congress. Not going to happen. So, THCO, have we heard of that one yet? No, what does this one do? This is apparently the latest extraction that is uh, being described as a psychedelic three times stronger than weed. Oh. Oh, is that why it's called THCO? Because you go, oh. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. I mean, honestly, I don't know if I buy that because... <laughs> willing to find out. I don't think... I think you'd have to be a lot stronger than three times weed to get to psychedelic. Well, I mean, allegedly, if you eat 250 uh, uh, milligrams, you're going to start seeing, like, uh, 250 milligrams and over, you're going to start seeing shit as far as yeah, edibles. I guess that's, yeah, that's, that's the that's rumor. Rich times. can confirm that. Yeah. He ate 400 milligrams one time, and apparently he said he had a good old time. Buy the alternative cannabinoid at stores all over Chicago that specialize in selling quasi-legal products. Let's see. Yeah, they talk about the Delta 9 and the Delta 8, but THCO is far more potent than that. Is this something we're going to start seeing in edibles? Is that the practical application? Or maybe cartridges uh, with it? No, I think we're going to see it like made completely illegal. Oh, we're going to see it like it. Is, are we going to start seeing this shit at gas stations? They're going to chase it down like they're doing all these strains. You know, this is, this is a game of whack-a-mole right now with all these variations on, on cannabis that we've been seeing. And eventually they will all be sorted into one of two buckets, completely illegal or just weed. Call it what you want. You're just selling weed. It's going to be regulated like all other forms of weed. Or if we say that it's stronger than that, then it goes into the completely illegal, which is probably where the THCO, if these claims are correct, will end up. You know, THCO sounds like fun. Yeah. Heard but I can't. Two. I mean, it's like, if, there, if this is correct, if these claims that it's three times as strong, I mean, you can't just sell like what? How, I was going to say, like how, how, much, how uh, strong can alcohol get legally? It depends on the state, but like, I know you can't get like 100. Can you get 100 proof in Michigan? Oh, yeah. No, but you're thinking like 200 proof. Would that just be like straight up 100% alcohol? Yeah, you can get I right. Know. So you can't you can't get over 200 proof then, right? It's just not physically well, possible. Yeah, because it's just alcohol. Well, yeah. I know they have things like 
Everclear, I think, right. used to be. Right. So there, so there's limits. You know, yeah. so, so if this shit is coming in at the, like the super high end of the, of the cannabis spectrum, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to be made illegal in most states, just like, you know, Everclear is in most states. You know, anytime I've ever had Everclear, it's fucking, uh, somebody's, it, it's been like in an unlabeled jar. Like somebody knew somebody who like yeah. made it or like, uh, right. Well, that, there's still there's states where you can buy that I think because there's that's one of the ones that they use for processing uh, cannabis extracts. I know there was a there was a New Year's party I was at. It, I was in my twenties, but somebody was passing around fucking moonshine they made. Oh yeah, I've had some moonshine. It's just nasty. Yeah, I don't understand. Like it's like I feel like I'm drinking it's, it's something like, that it, yeah paint I, thinner. I popped open a can in my garage and now i'm yeah. drinking it right like alcohol you have, you have to get past the 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 the, the alcohol is telling you not to drink it yes right? <laughs> in general even beer when you first smell it as a child it, the beer is going don't drink me well, no, you're getting, i'm nasty being drunk is a, you are it is a controlled yeah. poisoning that is what yeah, yeah, that yeah. is literally what is happening and you have to push past that but yeah i uh, drinking moonshine like that my body is still screaming like no, you shouldn't be doing this. This is poison. <laughs> like just smelling it. It's something that's happened while you're drinking it. Your body is like, no, no, no. Stop this immediately. And you have a couple shots of it and you don't give a fuck. Exactly. Yeah, well, once you get it past the nose, the rest of your body's like, no, this is fine. This is fine. We're fine, man. It's yeah. cool. It's all good. It's one of those things you can feel it go through your system. You can tell where it is in your body. <laughs> You can follow its adventures like it's Osmosis Jones running through your oh, body. Oh, no, you can feel it. Like, okay, and, it, and it's in the stomach. Did you see that campaign ad I sent you in the chat? Oh, yeah. A dude blazed. Did he, did he actually light up on his, in his commercial? Uh, that's what it says. What? Gary Chambers Jr. smokes a joint in new ad for U.S. Senate seat. Uh, he's running in New Orleans. Louisiana. Puffs a rolled blunt of marijuana while in a voiceover, he decries the impact of anti-drug laws and calls for the decriminalization of those who possess small amounts of pot. You just take a big hit and he's like, that's some bullshit. <sighs> yeah. I think you can make your point, though, without, without smoking it, right? Because that's your job application. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't know. But I, you also have to know if it's going to... Hopefully you'd think when you get to this level that he had a bunch of people doing a bunch of research that told him the people that he'd represent would be into that. Oh, sure. Or he's just, or he's just taking a wild-ass chance. Like, I, I, I doubt looking at the gentleman, seeing what he's doing in the ad, that he's perhaps representing a large swath of suburban white people. No. I'm going to say no to that one because I don't but think also that would fly and get him elected. But he also doesn't, he's not like one of these wacko, I'm never going to get elected, I'm just running for the attention. Like, he seems, he, he seems legit. Well, yeah, say, it, the neighborhoods he's trying to represent probably are like, all right, we're cool with this. I also say my feelings about someone had to be that guy, right? Someone, uh, you knew it was going to happen at some point. We're talking about him. He's getting a little bit of buzz. My question is, is he a legit candidate? Is this guy that's, is this a guy that's going to get a decent percent of the vote, or is this someone who's going to get maybe one or two? Be like, oh, I voted for the weed smoking guy. Yeah. Oh, I. Who could know? Was the ad recorded in a dorm room? Is he on a beanbag chair? Is that Bob Marley they, poster behind him? Is it just not coming up on my link, or do they not have the actual ad? Yeah, I don't think they have the ad. Yeah. I always hate ads. I always hate stories that do that. Oh, here's a picture of him. He's sitting in a sitting in a high back uh, chair, leather chair, very nice looking, but it's outdoors. Ah, no, I found the ad. Gary, I keep wanting to call this guy Gary Peters. That's a local politician, isn't it? Yes, Gary Chambers Jr. Every 37 seconds, someone is arrested for possession of marijuana. 
Since 2010, state and local that police have arrested right an estimated him like 7.3 million up on Americans for violating marijuana laws, over half of all drug arrests. Black people are four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana laws than white people. States waste $3.7 billion enforcing marijuana laws every year. Most of the people police are arresting aren't dealers, but rather people with small amounts of pot, just like me. I'm Gary Chambers, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate. And I approve this message. So that was all done. That was all voiceover. You don't ever actually see his lips move. And the whole time he's sitting in a leather chair out in the woods somewhere in a purple suit, smoking a blunt, just looking serious. I mean, I'm done with his message. Yeah. No, I mean, this, this isn't like, you know, it gets mentioned in the ad and there's a brief shot of him smoking. This is like, I'm going to do an ad about smoking. While smoking. Yeah. I wish him well. I'd, 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 I'd get behind him. I do too. If I, I lived in New Orleans, I'd vote for him. I found that on his Twitter page where he says, I hope this ad works not only to uh, destigmatize the use of marijuana, but also forces a new conversation that creates the pathway to legalize this beneficial drug and forgive those who are arrested due to outdated ideology. I, that's a pretty solid message. I can't really disagree with any part of that. Also, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't overhype it and call it some wonder drug. He just says it has benefits. Nobody can argue that. And he calls out all the people whose lives have been upset over ridiculous arrests for yeah i'd support him if and he was running my district look at this sweet suit and he's a natty dresser you know but that's what i've always said i just want a candidate i can smoke a blunt with right <laughs> that's the 2022 version yeah because i'm a fucking moron who thinks that i'm as smart as all the people who run the country and that all that if i could just sit down and have a beer with the president we could solve all the world's problems Instead of Joe Sixpack, you got Joe Zigzag. <laughs> Joe Dimebag. <laughs> Joe Dimebag. There you go. <laughs> what does Joe Dimebag think? I'm picturing Joe Biden playing like a pointy guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> well, come on, man. It's metal. He's got corn pop. Yeah. He got part corn of the pop on section. bass. <laughs> I remember corn pop on bass. I played lead when Obama was on drums. Oh, that's racist, but probably true. Obama's a, he's somewhere in the rhythm section. Maybe Obama plays the bass. Well, name me a president that's a better dancer. South Park taught me every black person has a bass guitar in their basement. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. Well, yeah, good luck, Gary Chambers Jr. And uh, right. Uh, wrap it up. That's it for us. Wrapping it up, too. That, that's it for us, yeah. All right. Well, hit us up on the social medias on uh, Twitter at TheWeedsman420, uh, Instagram at TheWeedsman Podcast. Head to ChristopherMedia.net. Hit the PayPal button. Hit the Amazon banner if you want to help us out. And wherever you listen to The Weedsman Podcast, we're on all the platforms. Rate us, review us, help other people find the show. Uh, welcome to the new listeners, uh, to the to the people who have been with us forever. Uh, you know, by that forever, we, you know, for, you, you knew about it before it was cool. Thank you, and uh, just tell people uh, if you like the show, please thank you and yeah, stay sure. high. Stay high.
Did you know Amazon provides ways of working that fit your lifestyle? They know you value your time outside of work, juggling family, school, friends, or other activities. That's why they offer a variety of shifts that work for you. There are full-time, part-time, and even temporary opportunities that can work with your schedule with great starting pay and sign-on bonuses. If you want a career that fits and adapts to your lifestyle, head to Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is a proud equal opportunity employer. The Weedsman Podcast. ChristopherMedia.net.